All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight in the, the uh, I guess I don't need this, do I? Picking it up okay. Uh, coming out tonight in a snowy evening here at Weber State University. Uh, it is uh, kind of an interesting thing that we would come here and unite as an atheist and a Christian over viewpoint diversity, how social justice and identity politics are harming the university and culture. But we both, uh, while we're a really odd couple in, in many ways, because we're coming from polar ends in disagreement on certain very substantial uh, issues, we've got great uh, conversion on this issue. We both value the pursuit of truth. We value cognitive liberty. We value free speech. We value the university. Uh, you've often heard perhaps that uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's not true. But what happens in the university upstream does not stay in the university. It goes downstream. The university is one of the most influential institutions in Western civilization. As goes the university, so goes the culture. And that's what we're seeing happening right now at breakneck speed. Uh, things have transformed uh, at, at breakneck speed in the universities in the last uh, 25, 30 years that it's having a, a, an exponential impact on culture in terms of what we're calling social justice and identity politics and, and things like that. Uh, my background uh, and why I'm, I'm passionate about this too is uh, I grew up in Utah as a seventh generation Mormon. Uh, I ended up um, you know, growing up in a really uh, poverty situation where uh, it was a rebuilt garage for the first 16 years of my life. Uh, when we lived in, a, in an apartment complex in a very poor part of Utah, uh, I was actually shot at by a black person when I was about uh, four years old. I don't hate blacks. Uh, I go to an all-black church right now in Indiana. I'm the only, my family's the only white family there. Uh, with uh, a, a faculty member, I co-led a group on racial reconciliation with professors at Purdue University. I'm engaged in that topic. I, I, I want to pursue that. I think there are problems there. Um, you know, when you hear the, the term social justice, uh, when you're opposed to it, someone might think, you know, what's to be opposed to? Uh, you must be someone who, you know, is racist. You must hate gays, or maybe you're a greedy uh, Republican, uh, you know, capitalist or something like that. Uh, I don't hate gays either. In fact, I was at lunch with one of my gay pastor friends last week in Indiana. We engage on this topic. We uh, seek to have dialogue and generate more light than heat, and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I've faced my fair share of opposition in the university. A lot of people think that you know, you're, you're a white male. Uh, you come from a, a position of privilege, which, depending on how you take that, uh, maybe there's, there's some truth to that, but I'm also underprivileged. I've faced my opposition in academia. Um, as an undergrad, I wasn't permitted to even finish my talk on a uh, religious topic when anything uh, was supposed to go up there. I had to get legal representation as an undergrad during my uh, PhD program at Purdue University. I was in my fifth year, and I was told I had too much of a faith perspective um, and my, part of my dissertation was on the virtue of faith. Um, I ended up having to move on to a different university, terminate with a master's degree there, and get my PhD elsewhere. So I have three master's degrees and a PhD. Um, and then when I was a, a faculty member, adjunct faculty for about a dozen years at Indiana University, uh, I taught ethics and usually assigned books that were antagonistic to my worldview. Almost always I assigned atheistic texts and articles, uh, but in an ethics class every topic is controversial. And when I got to the part on human sexuality, uh, just like everything else, I would give two sides. I gave a different side than the textbook, something like a natural law argument. And I had a former uh, student in there, uh, or a student in there who was a former pastor who turned gay, who charged me with creating a suicidal environment. And the administrator just didn't even want to hear uh, the lecture, um, didn't want to hear my side of it until I had two atheist students that came to my defense in the name of 
uh, academic freedom and free thought, saying we've recorded his lectures, we disagree with his view on God and human sexuality, but if you punish him, he did nothing wrong, and if you punish him without even listening to the lectures, we will move from this university to another one because this is not free thought, right? So uh, talk about privileged. Uh, it's not the conservative Christian philosopher who's the majority in the universities. I understand what it's like to be on the other end. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, in our culture, as we're moving forward in this whole social justice kind of mantra, what I want to do uh, is uh, kind of give a backdrop uh, on the history of the university uh, because this talk is really about the university and culture and how we think social justice and identity politics is, is infecting it, and, and it's a bad thing um, by and large, and give you the nature of the university, what, what it, we think it should be about, and why it's uh, a value for civilization, and why it's a good that we ought to preserve. Um, the American University, just to start there, 1636, Harvard, its motto was Veritas, Latin for truth. The Puritans founded it. Yale, started several decades later, looks at Veritas, light and truth. Princeton started several decades later, and then Columbia University, on and on and on and on. And for about the first 250 years, most of those were uh, Christian. 80% of the uh, college presidents uh, by 1840 were members of the clergy. By 1890, church and chapel attendance were still required. That wasn't that long ago. There was a, you know, a debate that, that ensued over a period of 50 years, and at the turn of the last century, uh, there was a changing of the guard. There was a sort of a naturalist philosophy that, that came in. The ethos of the university changed, and um, you know, departments started changing from politics to political science, and and psychology to the Department of Psychological Sciences, and and you know, the new um, uh, master in town, so to speak, was science. It was the be-all, end-all of knowledge. And if you wanted to have credibility, then you need to attach yourself to the sciences as, you know, objective knowledge. Um, about that same time, something was happening over in Europe. After World War I, uh, you know, classical Marxism had failed. They, they predicted things that were supposed to happen. It never happened. Uh, workers of the world were supposed to, uh, you know, unite and throw off the bourgeois, the ruling class. Didn't happen. People pulled up their boots and they went to war with each other instead. And so they went to Frankfurt, Germany, where um, these new group of Marxists started thinking, um, you, we've got to retool this somehow uh, to infiltrate over time into culture through uh, education, through religion, and, and so forth. And this was called the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. Okay? And in critical theory, the idea was to criticize the pillars of Western civilization, everything ranging from race, class, gender, sex, and so forth, and divide those into two camps fundamentally, the oppressed and the oppressor, the victim and the victimizer, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Right? That was how you divided the world in, into two groups. Um, and at the time, uh, the Nazi party, the National Socialist Party emerged, and most of the leaders of this Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, number one, they were Jews, bad place to be in the 1930s, and number two, they were globalist socialists, not the national socialists. And they were all socialists, but one were Marxists and one were Nazis. They had to get out of there. They went over to the U.S., embedded themselves at Columbia University, and began sweeping through the Ivy Leagues, writing very influential pieces, which uh, worked their way to the apex by, um, you know, right in time for the 1960s uh, student uh, protest and sexual revolution in the 60s in America. Many of those students at the time uh, went on in, in college into grad school and then the professoriate, and uh, they studied in, in education and in the social sciences to bring about social justice, the things that they were then passionate about. And uh, the, even though you had a changing of the guard earlier uh, within the American university, still the ratio of, say, left to right, liberal to conservative, was probably about 2.3 to 1 all the way up until you hit the mid-1990s. That's when things started to change dramatically. Um, 
the uh, professors started to retire from the greatest generation. The baby boomers were moving in. Now we're seeing even a, a, a newer generation get in there. And the generations that were moving in had now had no political diversity. They, they were all very influenced by um, you know, social justice, by uh, the values there. And what's the ultimate value in uh, critical theory? Uh, the ultimate value is to liberate socially oppressed groups, whether it's sex, race, gender, class, and so forth. Um, and the ultimate view of reality for human relations was that there were nothing but oppressed groups, race, sex, gender, class, and so forth. Um, it impacted a lot of different things in academia, but by and large, what started to happen was the diversity, the intellectual diversity started to change as well. We got to a point really quickly where now the ratio for ages 65 and older of professors is 12 to 1 for those retiring. For those 40 and under, it's 23 to 1. And if you look at uh, New England professors, it's 28 to 1. And looking at departments like religious studies, it's 70 to 1. What happens in that kind of environment is you end up with an echo chamber. Uh, it's not healthy for students. You don't expose them to ideas. You end up getting uh, critical thinking out the window. And this is where critical theory really emerged in the social sciences and the humanities. And now it has started to creep over even into the hard sciences. Uh, where diversity and inclusion are the name of the game, but they don't mean what we typically think they mean. It's not only, even uh, only with the professors, but uh, as that goes, with the students. You know, a Yale study in 2017 revealed uh, something about uh, free speech and about speech codes. Uh, almost 50%, 48% support campus speech codes. There are certain words you cannot use. 81% say that words are a form of violence, right? And 33% say that physical violence is justified to prevent hate speech. And two-thirds say that hate speech is anything someone says that is hurtful to a particular person. So we have groups right now that want to oppose free speech, diversity of thought. In fact, even the buzzword thought diversity or diversity of thought or viewpoint diversity is is a code word for racist by some in that social justice camp in, in academia. Uh, why would words be a form of violence? Because words cause stress, and stress causes physical harm, right? So words cause physical harm, and it's justified then to be able to have physical violence back on them. And we see some of these more Marxist-type thinkers like Antifa, the anti-fascists, the globalists, right? Um, and these thinkers think that uh, free speech uh, ought not be. You shouldn't have it if, if certain words hurt. But look, breaking up with your girlfriend or boyfriend causes stress, right? Uh, so we shouldn't be able to break up with our boyfriend or girlfriend anymore. Or uh, teachers giving too much homework, that causes stress, right? So that could cause harm, so teachers shouldn't give homework anymore. Uh, on the face of it, it's, it's really problematic. But just to give you, you know, a, a real quick summary then in, in, in the sense of what we're talking about. Social justice is kind of a Trojan horse of a term. Uh, I, I have a problem with it because it means so many different things to different people. Uh, the more mundane idea would be help the poor and the oppressed. That's a good thing. All the way to, uh, you know, economic justice or ecological justice or even species justice or even you know, reproductive justice, abortion, LGBT justice, trans justice, uh, you name it, justice. And some of that stuff might be considered uh, an injustice to various people, right? But the idea here is that the universities are starting to transform instead of being institutes that uh, pursue truth as their telos, as their end, as their goal. They're becoming social justice universities uh, social experiments, if you will, to try to um, level the playing field. Um, if you've got any inequality, somehow that translates to injustice, whether it's race, class, sex, or gender. If there's any disparity, we need to be able to make that up through uh, maybe coercive means. 
uh, not persuasive means entirely. And so there's, there's much more that can, can be said on that, but uh, I'll go ahead and cut that for now. Cool, thanks. I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to stand. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. I'm going to focus on a different aspect of this question. I'm going to focus on the question of diversity, intellectual diversity in particular. So what you believe matters. And the reason that it matters is because if you have a certain set of beliefs in your life, in your belief life, then what you'll do is you'll try to create circumstances that you think are good for you and that you think are good for your community and that you think are good for the people you love. But if the beliefs that you have are incorrect, if those foundational beliefs are wrong, then you won't be doing those things. In fact, more likely than not, you'll be removing yourself from reality. You'll be removing yourself from a good life. So what I want to talk about today is how do we do that? How do we put our beliefs in alignment with reality? And the argument that I'm going to make today is that the way that you do that, the primary way that you do that, is through intellectual diversity. And then I'm going to end with some practical tools that you can use. So can everybody, can you hear me in the back okay? Am I carrying? Okay, thanks. So what is intellectual diversity? Intellectual diversity is being exposed to a plurality of ideas, many ideas you might find odious or harmful or even hurtful. Intellectual diversity is, I liked what, what Dr. Miller said, it's an, I don't know if you said it at this talk or you said it at the last talk, we did another one of these uh, this morning. We live in um, we all live in an echo chamber in some kind of a bubble. We hang out with friends who have the same beliefs. We go to universities who are now uh, overwhelmingly of people of, uh, who have an ideological convergence. Having a conversation with somebody or being exposed to different ideas, one of the things that does is that's a corrective mechanism that allows you to keep your ideas in check. So John Stuart Mill said it, if, if to, to paraphrase, you, you, won't, you won't even know, it's not that you won't know what somebody else believes, but you won't even know what you believe if you have somebody challenge those beliefs. So that process of challenging and the process of questioning is vital. But you can't just challenge and question ex nihilo, like from nothing, in a vacuum. You have to have a process of challenging and questioning in an environment where the people with whom you're having these conversations there are certain rules of engagement, right? So when, when we speak to Christians, there are certain rules of engagement, right? We have debates, we have, we have substantive disagreements, and then more often than not, we, we get drinks. I just want to say, interrupt myself and say, <laughs> p parenthetically, I've gone all over the world and I've spoken about uh, atheism and uh, basically how to deconvert religious people. It's totally true. And the folks from Rat Ratio Christi would go, no matter where I was, you know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, wherever, no matter where I was, and I always found that their questions were incredibly thoughtful, and they challenged me, and they probed me, and they made me a better thinker, truly. And one of the w reasons that it does that is that I wasn't just speaking to an echo chamber. I wasn't just speaking to people who already held, held those beliefs. And more often than not, what we see happening in universities now is that there has to be an ideological convergence. And people are afraid to speak out if they hold a heterodox idea. And we need to stop this. So it matters that you have true beliefs. One of the ways that you have true beliefs, we have corrective mechanisms engaging in conversations in my book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. I talk about how to make an infrastructure for yourself so you can speak to someone across a divide. You can speak to someone across a religious divide. You can speak to someone across a political divide. But you have to value that. Here's the problem with not valuing that. Not only will you not know what you believe, so in order to really flesh out your belief, as I said, you have to understand why, what, an, what an opposing view is. And if you don't understand the opposing view, there's no way to check your own view, right? There's nothing to bounce. In philosophy, we call it a dialectic. There's nothing to bounce your belief off of. So 
what you believe matters. Intellectual diversity matters. Uh, intellectual honesty matters. The, the uh, attitude in the American Philosophical Association's seminal report on critical thinking, it talks about an attitude. Critical thinking is an attitude. You want to be an ideal critical thinker? Part of that attitude is you have to have a willingness to revise your belief. Uh, I don't particularly, I am an atheist, but I don't particularly think of myself as an atheist. That's why it struck me as odd when you said from the atheist worldview. I, I, there really is no atheist worldview as far as I'm concerned. There's just a person who doesn't think there's enough evidence to believe in God. There are, just as there are Christian atheists, there are, I mean, just as there are, there, that would be a trick. No. <laughs> uh, just as there are Republican, Republican atheists, Republican conservatives, liberation theologians, people who deny the historicity of Jesus, you have the whole, the, the, the whole gamut. But I think that principle of it's important to believe what's true it has to be coupled with an attitude of, I'm willing to revise my belief. I'm willing to stop believing something if I have insufficient evidence for it. And that's not a skill. That's not like, in, in that report I said, the Delphi report, it's not like analysis, inference, explanation. Those are all skills. This is an attitude, like being trustful of reason. That's an attitude. The way you cultivate those systems of attitudes, particularly with the university, is through intellectual diversity. That's what you do. If everybody you know only believes the same things you do, those beliefs become normative. And then when you hear another belief from outside that space, you're, holy moly, that becomes a radical idea, right? And maybe it is a radical idea. But the only way that you would know it's a radical idea is if you train yourself. It's, it's got to be a habit of thought. And the mechanism that allows that habit of thought is hearing views that run counter to your own. You kind of think of it like a muscle, right? If you never exercise your muscle at all, and what's the muscle? The muscle is your, your faculty to engage people, your critical rationality, your, your, your reason. If you never engage somebody, the consequence is you'll miscalibrate your beliefs, and you'll think, you'll ascribe more certainty to the beliefs than are warranted by the evidence. Intellectual diversity is a way to keep that in check. That's, it's, it's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. You have to be honest with yourself. You have to be willing to revise your belief. You have to trust reason. You have to not suspend judgment, which we're teaching college kids to do now, but make better, more discerning judgments. And you have to be willing to say, wow, you know, hey, I thought this. I was wrong. Change your mind. Change, but not just change your mind to yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Change your mind so that other people can see it. That's how we help that's how we create a, a system in which uh, diversity flourishes, true diversity, not superficial diversity. So part of that embedded in that structure, how much time do I have? It's over there, I can't see it. A minute? Eight. Eight minutes. Oh, wow, that's good. I'm um, ahead of time. So part of that idea within that structure is I have a belief. I think it's true. I'm not positive I'm true. Just calibrate your belief to the evidence and be honest with yourself. So a few, few tidbits. Here are my, my deliverables for how people can use intellectual diversity as a tool to increase the likelihood that you'll be right about things and decrease the likelihood about fault being, being wrong about things. First, let friends be wrong. It's okay if you have a friend and there's not absolute ideological congruity. If your friend believes something, you, you, you support, I don't, I support Andrew Yang, in case anybody's wondering, <coughs> you support uh, Bernie Sanders, and he, and he or she supports Elizabeth Warren, <clears throat> that's no reason to have a blood feud and not talk to somebody. It's not even a reason to have a blood feud if you support Trump and somebody else supports Elizabeth Warren. Uh, it's odd, I will admit that. <clears throat> but that's the kind of thing where you get to bounce each ideas off of each other. And the strongest form of friendship, as Aristotle says, is the friendship between two virtuous people. Two people are honest with each other, willing to, to, say, to call people out on their bad ideas, not in public on social media, but in private. So that's one thing you can do. You can let friends be wrong. The other thing about intellectual diversity as a tool that you can use that is you can either use that to, to modify your own beliefs or to try to argue someone else's position. So let's say that you have someone with a substantive disagreement, right? So, so uh, we, we have substantive disagreements with each other, myself and Dr. Mill. Okay, let me try to take your side and you try to take my side. What an opportunity. 
What an opportunity. Because you're talking to someone who actually believes as opposed to someone who's just giving verbal behavior or lip service. So that's another thing you can do. Couples can do that as well, but be careful with that. Uh, here's another thing that you can do. You can ask somebody in a conversation uh, a disconfirmation question. So let's say you're having a conversation with someone and they have an idea that's just so wild to you that you can't possibly believe that someone would believe that. So you ask a few questions. Is this what you mean? And you get them to restate. You try to state their view in, in such a way that it's so clear. This is called Rappaport's rules. Rappaport's first rule. They say, wow, you expressed that so clearly, I wish I could have expressed that way. If you want to read a good book on that, the philosopher Dan Dennett in Intuition Pumps is a great, great section about that. So you're having a conversation. He says something, I'm like, I can't believe this. And then you say, is this what you mean? Tell me about this. And finally, you, you're looking for the ideal you're looking for is this comes from hostage negotiations. You're looking for, that's right. The moment someone says to you, that's right, you know that you've understood what they have to say. Okay? But this only, does this work with people who have similar beliefs? Yeah, but this works fantastic fantastically well with people who have divergent beliefs, right? So the next thing you can do is you can ask them a disconfirmation question. This is probably the most powerful tool, or certainly in the top three, top two most powerful tools in an intellectual tool set to speak across divides, to, de to manage. How do you manage intellectual diversity? This is a way to manage it. You say, okay, under what conditions could that belief be false? I'm not saying that belief is false, but I'm asking. What would it take for you to say, wow, you know, I thought the, the, we were doing the atheist and Christian thing, we built that. Okay, so let's, let's use that as an example. Under what conditions would you be willing to revise your belief that Jesus rose from the dead? There are only so many things that people can say to that. Maybe they say, well, uh, the bones of Christ, which means Jesus would have resurrected. Or maybe they say, well, they give you a defeasibility, condi a, a disconfirmation conditions. So now you know when you're in a conversation with somebody what that evidence would look like. But if you don't ask that question, you have no idea what it's going to take. Maybe it's not going to take anything. Maybe the person's just going to say, I'm never going to, I'm never going to revise my belief. But it's a prophylactic against you being frustrated because frustration is often the result of speaking to people who have, especially in this climate, who have different beliefs if we don't know how to navigate those conversations. So intellectual diversity is great. Cognitive liberty is great. But unless we teach the tools to help people commensurate, commensurately deal with that, then we're all left floating a sea and everybody's going to be mad at each other, right? We're all going to be upset. So what you believe matters, but how you navigate what somebody else believes also matters, right? So the only way that you can get that, the only way that you can have a rich and flourishing belief life yourself is if you have intellectual diversity. And I'm telling you in no uncertain terms, if all of your friends believe exactly what you believe, you need some new friends. You can keep the old friends, but you need some new friends. Because the consequence of that is that will push you down. That will, that will make it so that you will think that the beliefs you hold are absolutely eternally and immutably true. And then somebody else will come along with a different view and you'll be shocked by that because you'll, you've never heard that before. So, what you believe matters, how you navigate what other people believe matters, and it's really not, it's not particularly complicated. There's a series in my book, How to Have a Possible Conversation, it's right outside. Uh, there really is, there's a series of things that you can say to help you navigate intellectual diversity in a more uh, seasoned or respectful way. But unless you have that, it's not just, look, you, it's, there's no, I have no problem at all, in fact, this is true, of thinking of intellectual diversity as a social good, it's good for our universities, great, I have no problem with that. But the real reason is, it should be a selfish one. You should want intellectual diversity for yourself. Nobody should be able to rob you, if you're a student at this university, nobody should be able to rob you of hearing a, a, a professor in economics who's a Friedmanite or who's a Marxist or who's a, a, you know, who wants to transform the economy to a, to a green economy. Nobody, should able, nobody, should ha nobody has the right to tell you you can and cannot come to this lecture, who can and cannot be disinvited from university, only in those ways. It's, it's a way to be good to yourself, right? It's a, it's a way to kind of treat yourself to, to test your beliefs so that you can have a good life. That's why you want to believe things that are true, right? You want to believe things that are true so you can have a good life. You want to navigate those. 
difficult conversations with people. And all of that itself is embedded within the structure of you being honest with yourself, you being honest with other people. You'll find if, one of the things I found, again, I don't talk about the atheism thing much anymore, but one of the, th the things that I found about it is when you're really honest with somebody and you're forthright in your speech, people will respect you more and not less. Those are the kind of people you want to have in your life. And if somebody decides to boot you out because you don't, you're not an ideological congruence with what they have to say, you're better off without them in your life. If you place intellectual diversity as a value front and center, it's a way to be good to yourself. I don't think we need to, uh, we will just do it here, sitting here. Yeah, just go ahead and take a seat right there, and we're going to open up to the questions. I have a couple pre-planned questions here. We and, don't need uh, this, though, yes? Pardon? Do we need this? Um, I don't think so. I think it's backup. Yeah. Um, so my first question is to Dr. Miller. And, um, you know, there's some people that could say that, the climate at the university today is pretty much the same that it was a hundred years ago, only it has flip-flopped. In other words, the Judeo-Christian thought, you even said it, uh, these universities started as uh, universities to prepare people for the ministry of Christian ministry. And if uh, a lot of the thought that is dominant in the universities today would be brought up, they would have been shut down. Um, so why, it's just a matter of who's in charge and why are you afraid of where this is going to go? You weren't afraid of where it was going to go a hundred years ago. Yeah, I think, I think certain worldviews, uh, might be given over to the flourishing of those kinds of universities that encourage free thought and cognitive liberty and free speech and others who want to shut it down. Uh, and you can find some of that within a secular milieu, but certainly within a Christian milieu, where uh, we see that people, are our primary identity is being made in the image of God. Our identity is not in some group. Uh, I am fundamentally black. I am gay. I am Christian. I am a dad. No, I am fundamentally human, and it's in virtue of that that uh, we believe that we ought to be egalitarian with respect to people, treat people equally well, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But when it comes to ideas, we ought to be elitists. But that doesn't mean, because truth is that way. By, by its very nature, truth is exclusive to error, right? And certain worldviews believe that truth is real, that it's knowable. The pre-modern period, uh, Christianity, of course, even in modernity, uh, they proffer science as you know, the be-all, end-all, perhaps, of, of knowledge. But nonetheless, truth is real. It's objective. We can debate it. Um, Voltaire said something to the effect that, uh, I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it, right? Uh, Stalin said something the opposite. He said that ideas are more powerful than weapons. We don't allow our enemies to have weapons. Why should we let them have ideas? That's the fundamental difference of what we're seeing in the new changing of the guard in the universities when it comes to identity politics, where your primary identity is to be in a group that is antagonistic against some other group, right? That wasn't like that before this uh, in America, and not even under the older guard that was more naturalistic. Uh, but I would, I would say if we were debating a different topic, they would be working on borrowed capital from a Christian worldview. Um, but nonetheless, uh, what came previously still respected the dignity of the person and the free exchange of ideas uh, because it's healthy for everybody. This one, I don't think, uh, has that in mind. It's, it's the, the trajectory toward a social justice university, not a truth university, as the NYU psychology professor Jonathan Haidt calls it. Okay, thank you. And I follow up on that. Can, oh, can go I, ahead. Can I? Uh, I'm going to see if I can take my own advice and try to answer the question from a Christian review. Can you tell me how I do? <laughs> tell me how I do. The the Christian philosopher Kierkegaard said, "If everybody believes it, nobody believes it." 
And so if, if you live in a society in which everybody believes something, it's not clear that the, anybody in the society has actually critically thought about what it is. And if you wanted someone to truly accept Jesus, I'm saying if, then wouldn't that have to be a deliberative choice that someone made as a result of examining whatever it was? And so just, so, so you would need, oh, I'm getting a nod, I'm doing all right, good. <laughs> Extra credit for myself, I'm feeling pretty good about my own idea. Uh, so that, I think that's one idea, but, but I think it's really important. I think what you said is important because I do think there's a danger once this pernicious ideology dies down that whoever is in power, whoever is in charge, I am concerned about those people then, you know, it won't be diversity of weaponizing offices of equity and diversity and inclusion. It would be something else to have some new mechanism to, to discourage cognitive liberty. So I am concerned about that. And that's why I think that uh, academic freedom is important. I think free speech is important. I think secular is important. Uh, secular is important. One of the best arguments for secularism I, I ever heard was by my friend Michael Shermer from the Skeptic Society. And he said, that the reason that you want secularism is because your religion could not be in, in power, right? So you want all religions to be guaranteed a kind of freedom to operate. Do you want to go to church? Someone else wants to go to the mosque or synagogue and, or the temple or the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, um, what Scientologists go to, is it a temple? I think it's a temple. Sorry, sorry. Anyway, whatever. But you, so that's kind of an argument for secularism. But I do think you're right. I think that there is a danger in when people come to power with a dominant moral orthodoxy and an ideology that they then fire people they don't like, they give tenure to people they do like, I think that there's an incredibly dangerous, it's something that we need to be careful of. These are our, we need to treat these preciously, right? These are our engines of knowledge production. These are our competition in the, in the marketplace. These are where we mold young people. These are where we craft our future. And to give it a callous disregard for whoever's in power, that just, that just does not bode well. Well, I'm going to ask you, a, a, you don't have to answer this if anything. you don't want to. Yes, anything you want. Um, you, you said that you were on uh, circuit, you know, doing, pre preaching your atheism. We're not preaching atheism, but okay, go well, ahead. Well, whatever, yeah, uh, <laughs> whatever. But my point is, a lot of people say that uh, they're afraid of Christianity or religious because it divides and causes all this uh, conflict and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. My personal, I mean, I hate to admit it, but before I came to Jesus, I used to spend a lot of time in the gym and Taekwondo and stuff. And my favorite pastime was going to bars and picking fights. But since I've come to Jesus, he's created a lot of peace in my life and learning how to deal with conflict. So my question to you is, in the circles that you were in, fighting Christians, did you find that, and now you're fighting, well, uh, anti-intellectual diversity. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I have a kind of a bias myself to answer, well, the question that I just asked Dr. Miller was, yeah. I think Christians have a moral absolute that keeps them from being unjust to the people that differ with them. With the people, the circles, you've been, been suffering some persecution lately yourself. So I guess I'm asking you, were the Christians better towards you than the people that you're fighting against now? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair question. That's a reasonable question. I'm happy to answer. I just want a few correctives in there. I never fought Christians. In well, fact, yeah, I, 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 I hear Some you. of my best friends are Christians. I'd go out and after the events and I'd hang out with Christians and we would drink. Fought to, the thought to the of hours. Christianity. Yeah, I, I, my, my, the, the thing that, I don't even know if I have an ax to grind against the right way to put it, but the thing that's always been deeply disturbing to me is people claiming to know things they could not possibly know or people calibrating their confidence beyond the warrant of the evidence and telling everybody else well you should do this because it's in my book or you should do this so that was the perspective that I was coming from but to answer your question directly there is absolutely no question whatsoever that this the the I'm trying to say it in, in, in a neutral way because I do feel that this has an emotional valence for me. The, the um, people who have really serially harassed me for really quite some time now, not a single one of those persons was people were Christian. 
they were all social justice warriors. And let me give, if, if I may give you some examples of that. So I already mentioned when people would come to the talks or whatever, and we'd argue and we'd debate, or you know, the Christians would just want to debate. If you look at someone like Richard Dawkins or Jerry Coyne, they would publish an article about you know biology or evolution, and what Christians would say that's wrong. I you know I want to debate you or what have you, but nobody is calling them a rapist. No one's emailing their wives and telling their wives these insane stories. Nobody's trying to get them fired. Nobody's trying to get their PhD uh, taken away from them, their PhD taken away from them. No one's trying to make them lose their tenure. My friend from Portland State University, Bruce Gilly, just emailed me today, and uh, he was the guy who wrote the, in defense of colonialism, and I spoke to him about that in the, at length. In the journal. He received death threats from that. The journal letter received, quote-unquote, credible death threats, and they retracted the piece, and then he has all this stuff on his office door, you know, racist and all this stuff. It's simply not true. But, yeah, there's something, there's something particularly nasty and vile about this ideology that caused people to lash out. And I can sincerely say that I never received any, literally anything like this from Christians. Well, thanks for being honest about that. True, sure. Well, I have some other questions, but I, I want to open it up to y'all. Is there any questions out there before we go on with some? Don't be afraid to ask. Please ask away. All right. Here we go. Um, I'd like to know, uh, other than each other, yeah. who would you recommend reading that opposes your particular viewpoint? Something you find uh, really tractable. In terms of social justice? Uh, anything. Whether it's uh, uh, somebody who is a Christian, let's say, in your case, somebody that you respect, another philosopher, perhaps, or somebody else that holds an opposite view from you, that you find their, their arguments to be cogent and worth interacting with, even though you still disagree with them, and, and other than each other. You want to go first? Sure. Um, you know, when I, when I was at, uh, I, I studied as a grad student under William Lane Craig, and then I wanted to test my medal or test the medal um, and study under William Rowe, a famous philosopher on the problem of evil. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, you know, I got a letter of recommend from him. He's an atheist at the same school where I had other faculty members, I think, subvert my, my PhD. Um, I would say, you know, other people like, like Jerry Coyne uh, that he had mentioned uh, in biology would be one, uh, I think, I, I'm less enamored by, say, the arguments of Richard Dawkins. I don't think, uh, I think he enters into a field in philosophy that he's not trained in. Uh, but in their own fields, Bart Ehrman, right? Uh, he's another example that I don't agree with his views in, say, New Testament um, history or something like that, uh, text, canon, uh, things like that. Uh, but I think he would be one that opposes my viewpoint that, that I would look at. Uh, when I taught New Testament at Indiana University, I would not use typically, uh, you know, the Christian authors that I would normally go to. I would use something like Marcus Borg um, because, I, you know, that would be one from a different vantage point. So there are, there are plenty of plenty of non-theist, non-Christian authors that I would encourage people to read and that I read myself. I've read Marx. I enjoyed reading Das Kapital. I, I could empathize. I could see what, what made his heart bleed for the oppressed. Even today, I, I'm reading books on critical theory and social justice by proponents of those viewpoints. Because, you know, as Epictetus, the Greek philosopher, said, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason so that we listen more. I want to I understand uh, the viewpoints that are not my viewpoints so that uh, in case I'm wrong, I can be corrected. It does no one any good to hold false beliefs. So I could give you a, a huge list of authors that I disagree with that I, I would recommend. Yeah, I, I, I want to piggyback something you said, then I'll answer your question directly. I think the problem is that we always look, when we want to confirm our own beliefs and we want to try to seem fair-minded about it, we find someone who's a freaking lunatic on the other side, and we're like, oh, look at this guy. I was fair about this. I read this stuff. But, but that's, not, that's, not, that's a kind of intellectual dishonesty to buttress what you already believe. 
Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll tell you w what I've read. I published a bunch of uh, fake papers that got me in a whole bunch of trouble. <laughs> and that's a story in and of itself. But to do that was a tremendous amount of work. And what I found w when I did that, um, I found that almost everything that I read, I agreed with the kernel of everything I read about racism and power and privilege and oppression and, um, you know, Larry Elder doesn't like the word, the, the words, but, you know, systemic injustice or systemic bias, things of that nature. And so f for me, the journey was less, so, I'll give you a particular person, but less so a particular person, but a milieu, like a whole line of literature, like really, like what he said, like finding the best and thinking about it. And with Christianity, I would say um, the arguments that have given me pause, God, I could really talk about this question a lot. Um, it, so with Christianity, the arguments that given me, that made, really made me think the most, or mentioned this to you in the car, was William Lane Craig's argument with Alex Rosenberg. He lays out in syllogistic format uh, seven or eight arguments, and I use those arguments in my New Atheism class, and I say, look, these are totally accessible. Here they are, and we talk about them. And that's when I invited you to come in, and I said, what are your best arguments? Because I, I genuinely do believe people should hear arguments, not from me, because I don't believe them, but from people who believe them, and then they can make up their own minds. Um, in the realm of critical theory, I would say that the... Uh, in the realm of gender, I would say that it's Judith Butler um, with... Um, the best person out there for fat studies is this woman, Charlotte Cooper. I'm not recommending it. I'm saying it's the best stuff that I've read in that. For um, racism, I want to say Coates, but uh, I'm not sure. It depends if you want a more academic look. Um, I would say I read, I just finished White Fragility. I can't say that I, I recommend that, but it gave me a really good understanding of how someone would think about it. Robin uh, yeah, Rob, it's Robin D'Angelo. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's original works, I think, are indispensable to read because they talk about there is some truth in intersectionality. That's the other thing. There's some truth in all of this stuff. Uh, so mapping the margins was good. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if there's any, like, one particular person. I just think it's just exposing yourself to people who have risen to the top in these things, you know, and then taking a look at those. And just one more thing. That's why in the, uh, the atheism class when I teach arguments, it's always interesting to me that my colleagues teach what I consider to be dead arguments. Like they'll find people, you know, like Aquinas or no, as far as I know, no apologist I've ever seen uses Aquinas, right? You, you want to use, you want to take a look at the arguments that, that people, the best people in their fields think will persuade people. Not, you know, the, some lunatic out there. You want to look at the best arguments. And if you can do that, it's a way to kind of up your intellectual game. Sorry about the long answer. It's just a great question. Good question. Another question. Come on now. All right. And if you could use the mic, because everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I was wondering if one or both of you could name either a movie or maybe a book of fiction that best makes the case for what we're all here about today. Oh, yeah, that's very easy for, for me. Um, I, I have read what, what I consider to be the, the singularly the best book. I have uh, a lovely a book, but it is, you know, it's a hybrid book between popular and academic. It's Cynical Theories. I read the manuscript c coming out. Uh, from Helen Pluckrose and, and James Lindsay, and it's an utter masterpiece. It's the most, if you read this and truly take this in, and you have to live with this because it's not light reading, you will have knowledge, you will have a, a near master's degree level knowledge of this stuff. Cynical theories from Pitchstone Press, singularly, with, I can un tell you with unshakable confidence, it is the singular, the best book that I have read in this, the best manuscript that I have read in this, that will probably be written for the next quarter century. I don't read fiction, and I don't watch a whole lot of movies. I think, 
the, the best kind of uh, video, if you want to call that, movies, I would say look at his stuff on grievance studies. <laughs> it's fantastic. You'll, you'll get the, the point easily. Uh, we also have, you know, booklets that uh, are downloadable from Rocio Christie's website on engaging critical theory in the social justice movement. Some of them are out, out there in hard, you know, in, in booklet form right now, 10,000 words. Um, a big, like a chapter and a half. Can I add yeah. to that real quick? So you said the best. I'm going to give you the, some video stuff. Uh, Mike Nana's YouTube channel is really quite mind blowing. If you haven't seen that, and they're all free, obviously, they're on YouTube. N A Y N A, Mike Nana. He documents some grievance study stuff. If you want to watch something, like if you want to see what, in, what you know, you've seen this things like Your Mind and Intersectionality, you want to see a governmental system on an intersectionality, uh, Benjamin Boyce. His stuff on how this is being institutionalized in Washington is phenomenal. That's, uh, he's another documentary filmmaker. So make Mike Nana and Benjamin Boyce. Great, thank you. Yep. And uh, it's not fictional, but uh, what was that college that start, has green in it? Evergreen. Evergreen College is really show. And both, both Mike Nana and Benjamin Boyce document that. All right, come on, we got to have another one. All right, I'll come to you. You don't have to come. Great questions, by the way. So what chance does a university really have nowadays since, we're all get, since they're all getting funded by the federal government? And you can go over here to the ivory tower and talk to the president, and his knee-jerk response is, well, that's the law, that's the law. And you look at how bad the, not only the state government but the federal government has um, not so much... Uh, has butchered the language, and particularly when we look at uh, not social justice, but it's really social engineering. Nobody can s see that, and nobody can do that, but they'll dupe the ingenuous adolescents that were getting spoon-fed their whole life. They love the idea of playing on a computer and it getting outdated every other month because then daddy has to buy them a new computer. So what's the question? The question is, what, what chance do we have at a university because the universities or hell bent on just butchering a language to spew their one-sided dementia. You mean what chance do we have to, to, to help intellectual diversity flourish? Yeah, at the university because we're getting goat roped by the law, by the federal government. Goat roped, I like that. <laughs> I would have to remember to use that, goat roped. Um, you want to take that or me? Well, yeah, look, uh, Jonathan Haidt, who is... Um, the author of The Coddling of the American Mind, um, has got some great videos. Uh, if, if this is a video a movie, look at his Duke lecture three years ago on uh, the two incompatible um, uh, values in American universities, truth and social justice. Just go YouTube that one. Well, he is also the founder of the Heterodox Academy. And you think about that, look, when, when, when a community gets so ingrown, when it gets so uh, homogenous, uh, there is a political homogeneity, same thinking, echo chamber. It gets to such a point where it, it almost becomes sacred. And if you violate this, then you could, even, you could get silenced, you could get shamed, or you could get destroyed in your career or something like that, right? So Jonathan Haidt and others have noticed what's happening in the universities. And they have made efforts to develop think tanks like the Heterodox Academy uh, and joined with uh, other organizations that try to keep track of universities that uh, adopt free speech or free thought uh, perspectives. And so the one that first started was the University of Chicago. Princeton quickly jumped on it. And then Purdue was the first public university to jump on it. And now there's about 90 that have signed on. Well, over 5,000 universities in the U.S., and only 90 have signed on. And even those that have signed on, one of them we had to sue this past year, and we won, by the way, uh, because, you know, they kept us off because we didn't fit their viewpoint. And at any one time, I've got between two to five uh, cases of legal proceedings happening at one of our campuses around the country just because of that issue. I think we have to keep pressing it. Uh, we have to coalition build like this because even though, you know, Christian and atheist, different perspectives, different politics even, uh, this is something precious that we cannot lose. This is, this is a new movement that's foreign to 
uh, the American way of doing things, the American life, and to the whole uh, telos or purpose of the university is to pursue truth through debate. Now with this new view, debate equals hate or uh, debate is to invalidate, invalidate my existence. You can't even have a debate. Uh, we were called in this, in this letter that went out uh, to the USU uh, president that was intended to get the event shut down. Uh, we were referred to as logical fascists. Uh, how is that? Because we uh, prefer reason and, and debate and dialogue, right? Viewpoints that can help strengthen us. Um, that's viewed as by some as a Western colonialist, imperialist, way for a hegemonic power to keep the oppressed oppressed. So I think we need to, even if it means, you know, coalition building, and we ought to still be friends no matter what, but I think events like this are important because they show, look, we, we've got some substantial differences, uh, but we need to unite on this thing because this is ruining the university and it's ruining culture. And if I can just give you a couple quick examples, too. Uh, Jerry Coyne was one that we had mentioned up here. He had a blog article recently uh, about what happened at the University of Berkeley like, last month. I think there's a lawsuit on it now. But about 800 applicants for three or four biology prof positions. And out of 800, 75% of them just got pushed away if they didn't fit the group identity they were looking for. So that, and, and it's not just that they didn't fit the group identity, but they have to submit uh, a, uh, a statement on how they have advanced diversity in the past. And diversity doesn't mean viewpoint diversity. It usually means maybe skin color, uh, body parts, or something like that, right? Not the most important kind of diversity at the university. Um, you had to advance a statement to show how you've advanced diversity in the past and a statement on how you're going to do it in the future. So 75% of applicants were just pushed aside. They could cure cancer, right? Uh, genetics, biology, things like that. Uh, Yale University recently also um, pulled grant money away from any of their law students if they were going to do internships with conservative groups. Why would you do that? Why? Because the majority of Yale faculty uh, take a not just liberal, an illiberal liberalism uh, that is going in the social justice route that think that, that, that viewpoints of certain conservative groups are hate groups, right? Michael Bloomberg, he's running for president. He, he spoke at Harvard's commencement address. He notes this as well. He spoke to the students and he said, Harvard, like many of these Ivy League universities, is a good university, but it's not a great university. Why? It's good because it practices a diversity of sex and gender and race, but it's not a great university because to be a great university, you also have to have viewpoint university. And he says there, there comes a problem when 96% of Ivy League faculty give campaign contributions or gave campaign contributions to Barack Obama. He said, something tells me that students here are not getting a fair shake of the political spectrum, right? They're not. These are becoming echo chambers. And when they have such a, a huge number of people agreeing together, it becomes religious. Um, and that starts to become dangerous. You don't need, you know, one to one. Four to one might be fine. So long as you I'll have... I'll take ten to one. Ten to one, so long as so long as you're keeping you know people honest and you've got a representation uh, for disconfirmation bias. Did you want to answer that one? No, I want to see if we can get some some a lot of okay. lot of folks. All right, come on. All right, here we go. So I really like the the atheism and Christianity lens as as a way to talk about intellectual diversity. Because it's the, the types of evidence that you use for both sides are so different, and, I, and I'd love to hear you talk about how you reconcile that. Where for for Christianity, the evidence in favor of that is is largely personal and subjective, as, and for atheism, it's it's mostly general and objective. How 
how, how do you how do you go back and forth? I mean, to have a productive conversation to, to really address those two things. How do you reconcile the different types? You want to go first? Sure. I mean, I would I would challenge the dichotomy you just made there. I don't I don't think Christianity is a faith tradition. I think it's a knowledge tradition. I think in the last hundred years, American Christianity uh, has become an abysmal example of what Christianity was throughout its history as a knowledge tradition. It was the universities emerged from Christianity. They flourished for the first 250 years here with that, that worldview. So it, it's not subjective. It, I, for me, anyway, and I think I, that would be a better representation for Christianity, I think it would be objective. I, I think that's why we can have a debate, and we ought to have debate, too. Um, there are subjective elements in it, but uh, we're looking at the same data. Uh, we come to the data with a worldview also. Uh, we have different interpretations of the data, and maybe we've been exposed to different reasons, different arguments, and there's maybe certain uh, uh, volitional or emotional things that we need to consult along those lines as well. Um, but I think the, the pursuit of truth uh, is something that um, I think I've probably lost where your question was going because I got sidetracked on the dichotomy. I'm sorry. We didn't take. I didn't take it that way. Donald's routes to truth. There's demonstration on one side and dialectic on the other, yeah. and, and and both of them lead to truth, very, very right. real truth. Yeah. And and so I think that just the ways that that science and religion tend to get where they're going are different paths, and and, and that's been one of the challenges that I've. Yeah, so I'll, to, to, or do you want to go some more? Uh, no, go ahead. I, I might come back on it. Yeah, so two things. So before I answer your question directly, I, my first book was a manual for creating atheists, and I talk about how to have those conversations. I did an app, Atheos, so basically someone says something to you and it runs you through these dialogue trees. But here's what I've learned. I have done this, I'm telling you, I have had, at this point, so many conversations with people for so many decades that, one of the things that I've learned is that why is it that if you have an identical body of evidence, literally identical, two people can look at the same body of evidence and come away with vastly different conclusions, whether it's Muhammad flew to heaven on a winged horse or the Christian, I mean, it doesn't have to be in the Abrahamic traditions, whatever it is. And the reason for that is that different people have different, this is the answer that I've come to. Different people have different threshold, thresholds for what, what constitutes evidence. So my threshold for evidence, I think, in some senses is, I, don't, I think it's higher, but higher makes it sound like the Christians are lower, so I don't want to say that. It makes it sound pejorative, to borrow your word. So I don't really want to say that. I think I have a different, maybe more stringent conception of, or, or a, um, a threshold. But here's something that I've learned from the philosopher Walter Kaufman that I think that this is incredibly useful tool, an intellectual tool that you can think about the question of religion from. So I, I think the bad way to think about it is a, what would a reasonable person think? Would a reasonable person who looks at this say, well, the laws of physics were suspended and some guy walked on water? Okay. I don't think that's the best way to look at it. I think the best way to look at it that answers your question directly is from Walter Kaufman, what would every reasonable person say? So you go from an, a reasonable person to every reasonable person. And by definition, unless you want to say that there's some weird, creepy kind of, you know, torrents of irrationality floating around, different people look at the same evidence and come away with different conclusions. So it's because they have different thresholds for what constitute evidence. And it's because if not every reasonable person would look at that. Some reasonable people look at this and that's just simply not true. And so that I think that those are helpful heuristics to think about the problem. Does that answer your question? If I may just, you know, come back to this then. So, you know, we're all asking philosophical questions too. The branches of philosophy are, you know, reality, knowledge, and ethics. What is real? How do I know what is real? How should I then live based on what I know about reality? When it comes to knowledge, uh, is knowledge ascertained through empirical means? the empiricists tradition, or through rational means, the mathematicians and the logicians tradition, or revelational means, or could it be all of the above, right? And so wherever we're deriving data to pull together 
we're interpreting that, right? Theology and science both are abstractions in that field of knowledge of the reality at hand. And so, you know, I think, I think uh, from a Christian viewpoint, and speaking personally, how do I reconcile these things? Uh, I embrace uh, science as a way of knowing. Uh, some of the, the fundamental founders of the subdisciplines of science, Mendel was a monk playing with his pea pods, uh, and, you know, in his monastery and came up with genotype, phenotype traits. Isaac Newton, uh, what inspired and informed him was his belief that there is a, a moral law. I wonder if there is a physical law. Um, uh, Leibniz, uh, you know, the father of, of calculus. Um, Kepler, uh, Linnaeus. Uh, Maxwell, you can go on, on and on, you know, down the line and find that in the history of Christian thought, there wasn't a, a juxtaposition between science and religion. Uh, sometimes you ask different questions in those fields, um, but the fundamental conviction that I think Francis Bacon, the father of modern science, who probably got this from Augustine, is that all truth is God's truth. God's book of nature and book of scripture, God's word and God's work. If, if we have good independent reasons for thinking that God exists and it's the author of said book of scripture, then what we want to do is to compare the data uh, of nature and scripture and you come up with interpretations of science and theology and you want to see, just like you would in a laboratory with all the data, you want it to be coherent. You want it to fit together. Um, and if it doesn't, then you've got problems. Maybe you need to look at a different model or something like that. That answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, I'd like to touch on something that you started at the beginning of the, of the discussion. Um, the, uh, the transformation of university uh, the program of study to be kind of what you later term grievance studies brought in by the by the critical school early on um, you kind of pointed that that was one of the causes but that can't happen unless the rest of the school of thought uh, in academia lets it happen so as someone who comes kind of from that generation on the edge of that generation what is it, I, and I'd like to learn from the history here what did the non-critical school of thought do wrong? What mistakes did we make? So we don't repeat those mistakes again, try to mend it and also not repeat it. You want to go or me to go? Go ahead. Okay, so that's a fantastic question and that gets back to the gentleman's question in the back about uh, chapter 10 of uh, Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay's book, Cynical Theories, answers that. The antidote to a lot of critical theory is liberalism. And I don't mean liberalism like the Australian Party liberal or how we use the word. I mean enlightenment values. Um, okay, so this is a very, very complicated problem, and it's taken me an unbelievable amount of time to figure this out. So I will condense it into, uh, into the bullet points. The first thing that happened is that people hire people who are like themselves. They hire ho the intellectually uh, homogenous. Um, there's a great essay by uh, Helen Pluckrose, in Aereo Magazine, How French Intellectuals Ruin the West. It's a fantastic little article that explains how postmodernism, so the original postmodernist, Derrida, Foucault, Lyotard, etc. Stephen Hicks has a nice little book that's raised considerable controversy up, up, up on that. But those ideas then became applied in the university system, and Pluckrose and Lindsay call that applied postmodernism. So how did we get into the situation where postmodernism is applied? It's, it's um, morphed from uh, the original postmodernists. Okay, so one way is I publish a, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, not name-dropping, I'm just saying that's where you can go if you want to see it. It's called Idea Laundering. That's an extremely important piece. It talks about just as there's... Uh, extremely important piece, in my opinion. I wrote it, so it probably would be an important piece. But uh, so it, it it uses a parallel. Idea laundering is Brett Weinstein's term. Money laundering, you take dirty money, you wash it, it comes out clean money. What we see happening in the grievance fields are these folks take ideas. 
They're just moral impulses. They discharge them through the peer review system. They come out with knowledge. That's one thing. The other piece, if I may also recommend another piece of mine that helps explain this, and I published a piece in the Philosopher's Magazine called Diluted Departments. And Diluted Departments, I take what I consider to be the single greatest insight in all of critical thinking, which is Michael Shermer's insight, for we've spoken about this, why, why do smart people believe weird things? Well, smart people believe weird things because they're better at rationalizing bad ideas. Groups of smart people believe the groups of smart people are even better at rationalizing bad ideas. So you now we're in a situation in which we have groups of really smart people in the academy rationalizing pretty horrible ideas, like ideas that are utterly untethered to reality. So diluted departments is another mechanism by which that took place. So there are multiple mechanisms. The other thing is that this is a, really it is a conceptually unique idea. This ideology has buttressed itself, it has built in mechanisms to buttress itself from any form of self-criticism. It's really extraordinary. But that's why this, I think, this is inherently unsustainable and it has to die out. You, you, because you have to know the other side of the issue, right? You have to know, you can't develop a defense of an idea unless you know the other side. But this is their defense. In other words, their defense is deplatforming, uh, non-consensual co-platforming that Judith Butler calls it. We're not going to even allow ideas to enter into the milieu unless we, we unless they're, they're, the, they're the ideas that are kind of stamped in the canon of knowledge. We are going to replicate this, credential ourselves. It's a very complicated problem, but I think that those data points are ways to conceptualize the problem. Couple that with um, institutionalized mechanisms in the university to keep the ideas in place. When you have that, you have 80% of a solution. That answer your question? Okay, cool. He's running around. Uh, right, while, while he's coming up, I, I guess I would, I would just echo what he said, but also uh, what's happening new with this movement is that it is uh, typically in the field of value or ethics, and it plays on the heartstrings, uh, you know, compassion. So in the Christian community, you often, you know, what would Jesus do? And, and there's a real sense in which, uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a sinner. I know that. And so, oh, so I'm guilty, too. And I'm, I've, I've got white guilt, even though I, I'm not uh, prejudiced personally. But somehow I have, um, you know, some kind of societal white guilt, even if I don't recognize it, and I wouldn't recognize it because I'm, I'm said to be part of the oppressor class. I'm, I'm the majority or the one in, in privilege and power, right? And usually it's, it's the one, as he said, immune from criticism. It's the one in the, uh, in the oppressed class, in race, class, sex, gender, or whatever, who has lived experience. This is the almost esoteric secret knowledge that can only be had in lived experience. Um, and if I don't get it, if I don't understand it, it's because I'm an oppressor, uh, or maybe if I'm even part of that community, but I'm not playing by the cards that I should be and saying the same thing that that uh, oppressed community is saying, then maybe I suffer with um, uh, not internalized oppression. I haven't had liberate, uh liberated consciousness yet. So you, if you want to read about that, you can read about standpoint epistemology, which is or sometimes called standpoint theory. Yeah. So you, that, that is an extremely helpful um, explanatory mechanism for how we got into this. Yeah. And the students really are, are making administrators feel guilty too. So you're seeing across the country, presidents of universities, that's why I wondered if Utah State would capitulate, right? Because if, if you don't, if you don't support us, they say, we, we feel unsupported, we, f we feel unsafe, right? And you are erasing our existence. And who wants to be a homophobe? Who wants to be a racist? Um, you know, who wants to be a hater? In our culture right now, the, the dichotomy is hate or celebrate. Which one do you want to be, right? And so people virtue signal as well, and they, they climb all over themselves to show themselves the most virtuous and the, the one who is helping the oppressed classes the most. Well, all right. Our do we have time for one more? We, she, she was so... Okay, one more question. 
And you guys make it a good, an quick answer. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this may piggyback a little bit off of the last one, but I was wondering at what point of this intellectual diversity in universities did it become okay to accept certain religious beliefs but not others? For example, Islam, Buddhism, things like that are accepted oh, readily, but yeah. Christianity is hate speech. Yeah, uh, uh, th there's, a, there's an explanation for that. that there, so there's a whole line of literature about that. So, so they view anything that's looked at as the dominant moral orthodoxy is inherently problematic, and they want to remediate those because they view that as, uh, as um, inherently oppressive and institutionalizing oppression. The, a really helpful way to think about this, and I've written about this with James Lindsay pretty extensively at this point, is that this really is a new religion. It's a new religion that has a cult-like feel to it. Uh, none of the uh, propositions are disconfirmable. We talked about disconfirmation. Uh, they're not really held. Not only are they not held on the basis of evidence, they're held in the face of, con I can give you evidence for, against a lot of these things. Uh, specific microaggression, strong claims, inadequate evidence, Scott Little and Fields 2017 paper. I mean, there's a lot of evidence against this stuff. Um, so. It meets the criteria of a religion, et cetera, but within that, I think that the way to look at it is the way that it privileges certain hierarchies through privilege and power, and it looks at Christianity as the religion that's currently uh, in power, and white, heterosexual, cis males, et cetera, are, are primarily the, the instigators or the perpetrators of that, so then by proxy, they're the instigators or the per perpetrators of oppression. And if you want to really hear something that's just like, you've got to be kidding me. So 20 years ago, uh, I'll do something I never do, but I'm going to ask you a question. Are you a Christian? Yes. Okay. So 20 years ago, I would have been your worst nightmare. I would have been your worst nightmare to send your kids and have me in their classes. Now, I'm your best friend. Now, I'm the guy you want teaching your kids. Now, I'm the guy I go to class. I literally go to my office and I have evangelical Christians waiting outside my office saying, please, please take my kid in your class. Please take my kid in your class. I get emails. I would say at this point, the bulk of support letters I get are not only, not only the not from people, I'm a liberal atheist, not only the not from liberal atheists, liberal atheists have fallen for, have fallen under the spell of this stuff, right? They, they have, They've been, in, it's, it's, James Lindsay calls it, it's a universal solvent. It is a mind virus. It is a religion that has evolved. And so when I see evangelical Christians coming to me, when I get all these um, uh, emails of support from an unbelievable number, voluminous emails, long emails, that tells you, and this, to once again talk about another piece that I published, check out this piece that I wrote because I really think it's the best explanation of, of why this is happening. I call it Culture War 2.0, and it's the Great Realignment. And here's the, great, here's the basic idea behind the Great Realignment. And you tell me if this makes intrinsic sense to you. So, Corey believes certain things about Jesus that I absolutely, positively do not believe. But we both believe that those things are either true or false, independent of our position, social status, of our sexual orientation, of our cis status, of our, we, so that's called the correspondence theory of truth. So Jesus walked on water would be a proposition. I think it's false. You think it's true? Okay, so I just wanted to, I didn't want to ascribe to you something you didn't believe. He thinks it's true, but we both agree that there's a truth about the matter. Okay, that's the first order of business. Second order of business is that we have certain rules of engagement. He says something I don't like, I don't say that he's a racist. He says something he, that I don't like. I don't report him to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and say that he's a rapist, right? He says something I don't like. I don't try to, what happened to my friend um, who's, a, who's an atheist podcaster, and this was not from a Christian, which was somebody's question, your question. This is not from a Christian. This podcaster, this, this lunatic, called all of this guy's sponsors and said that he was a white supremacist. He's not a white supremacist. He's as far as a white supremacist as you could go. It's a total fictitious. It's he does not play by the rules of engagement. So whatever disagreements that I have with him, I know that I'm going to get in the car, and he's not going to say that I tried to molest him. But no, but I'm really serious about that. Like there, there are certain rules that we play by. We have disagreements. We get out of the car. We shake hands. We move on to another day. 
So those are two of the things, correspondence theory of truth, rules of engagement. And I would argue to you, when you read this piece, I lay out these phenomenon. My, even though our metaphysics are different and our worldviews are different, and I've never asked him about specific political beliefs, but I have a feeling that he's much for, f farther to the right, further to the right than I am. Um, even though all those things are the case, I would argue to you that at this particular moment in cultural history, I have more commonalities with him than I do with a liberal atheist who is a social justice intersection, a social justice warrior. I have far more in common with my Christian friends who have very different political beliefs because the schism in the fault line isn't about politics. I think Trump is a lunatic. But that's not, for me, that's not, and for many people, those 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 are like mere ideological differences in a sea of something that I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but I really believe that this ideology is a threat to Western civilization. I truly, genuinely believe that. Yeah, and if if I could add, you know, just remember that disagreement is not denigration. Right. Right. We ought to be able to disagree agreeably and still be respecting each other. Egalitarianism with respect to humanity, elitist with respect to ideas. Um, and to just, you know, speak to that question you had again, just remember in this worldview of social justice, critical theory, neo-Marxism, and identity politics, call it what you want, throw all those socks on the wall. If one of them sticks, great. They're pretty close in proximity. Um, they've got a lot of similarities and, and connections together. The idea is that if there's any inequality, race, sex, class, gender, or whatever, that implies injustice. And the fix, the ultimate goal uh, of social justice is to rectify the inequality and make it equal. Economic justice, uh, gender justice, sex justice, LGBT justice, um, ecological justice. No, no, I, I'm sorry, I haven't interrupted you all, but I have to interrupt. Not just equal. Um, equity. Yes. Not just equal. Uh, equity, which is which is which is a completely different phenomenon from equal, but we're up times. We're doing two more events. When tomorrow. University of Utah tomorrow at noon and UVU seven p.m. tomorrow.